This is Trep Wire with this special guest podcast, tracking CRE performance. I'm Martha Kocher with Trep, a data modeling and analytics firm for the CMBS commercial real estate and CLO markets. I'm with Manis Clancy, and joining us today is Ethan Chernovsky, VP of Marketing for Placer AI, a research firm that uses cell phone data to track consumer behavior. Ethan, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Tell us some background without getting too technical for us about Placer AI and how the technology works. Sure. So uh, we are a location data and foot traffic analytics platform. And, you know, in the simplest possible terms, if you think, you know, people vote with their feet and we're showing you how people are voting every day across the United States, um, a little bit more complex. Uh, we see a panel of about 30 million devices in the U.S. And then we utilize AI and machine learning algorithms to make estimations on the visits to any location anywhere in the country. And I know there's a lot of conversation lately about uh, exposure to private information and data security. Give me an overview of what you guys do to protect the anonymity of the data. So critically, we're not interested in the individual user. Um, and I think this is a really important piece of the puzzle. So we're, we're only taking in anonymized aggregate data. So we're not even ingesting personally identifiable information because we're only interested in those macro trends and having that panel that we can then apply our algorithms on top of. And so, you know, from a GDPR, CCPA perspective, you know, we're well ahead of the curve and, you know, take ongoing actions to make sure we stay there. So this is a pretty technical field, a pretty quickly growing field. How did you get into this in the first place? Give us a little bit of the background and, and how did you find yourself at Placer? So, I, you know, I come from the world of data personally. I worked at a digital intelligence company called SimilarWeb. And you kind of see the power that data has to really change the way that we make decisions. I think the, the really exciting thing about Placer for me and I think for us as a, as a company is you're bringing something that's so uh, core to how things have been happening in the world of startups and online since the inception of those industries to a sector that just hasn't had access to data in the past. So it's, it's not just that you're able to provide, you know, incremental value, you're provide you're opening a door that simply didn't exist in the past. And that's very exciting and incredibly, you know, inspiring for us on a day-to-day -day basis, knowing that we're bringing something to the market that just didn't exist in the past and can fundamentally change the way that offline businesses operate. Before we get into kind of the nuts and bolts of, of what you do and some of your findings, give me the biggest surprise that you've had since you got there between what you expected your business to look like and those who would demand your services versus the reality of what you've witnessed over the last couple of years. So I, I think the first, I mean, the, the honest to, to God basic, biggest surprise was oh my God, this CRE industry is massive and I didn't know it existed. And I think when you're kind of, when you're kind of, uh, you know, a regular person going about life, you go to a supermarket, you go to, you know, retailers that you love, and you don't even realize that there's this underlying ecosystem of, you know, shopping center owners and the brokerages and the people underwriting it that underpins everything that happens in offline retail and that so much of the innovation and the big ideas and the huge changes that are happening are actually centered in this world that is operating under the surface. And what's been, you know, really interesting for me was you go to the same shopping centers you went to a few years ago, but now you notice, you know, the names of who owns the property and you think, oh, well, you know, how does this align with their wider strategy? And it's been this, there's this foundational component to the offline economy that I didn't really realize was there. And I know that seems so simplistic, but I think it's the case for a lot of us who are new to the CRE space. And it makes it really fascinating to kind of dive into it and understand what the ramifications are for all of these decisions. I remember us talking about tracking foot traffic in commercial real estate a couple of years ago. And there probably was no better use case than COVID and a massive shutdown of all businesses, retail, et cetera. Tell me a little bit about how that created an opportunity for your organization that honestly may have taken much more time to unfold. So, I mean, what's interesting is I think it's like a lot of COVID related trends that it was already happening um, it may have made it might have made it happen faster, 
but it, it wasn't something that we weren't seeing already. So, you know, heading into COVID, we saw tremendous demand for the product, lots of excitement, lots of, you know, really creative use cases. I think what's been interesting in the last few months has not been so much. I think the commercial real estate and even the retail sectors have really embraced the power of this technology and are either using or trying to figure out how to use or who to use um, within the landscape. What's been interesting is that I think a lot of other companies and businesses that may not, it may not have seemed as, as obvious for them to use it are getting really interested. So the entire world of kind of, you know, consumer packaged goods, it's, it would have been very fair to think that, all right, this isn't a really valuable tool for them to have. They have other data sources that are more important, but we're seeing so much demand from that sector and so much creativity in those use cases that I think that's been really eye-opening and realizing that the, the scope of impact that this type of data can have is just absolutely enormous. Let's dig a little bit into some of the data that you guys have published over the last few months. I think a lot of it's really interesting in terms of looking at some of the property subsectors in the retail space. One of them that I thought uh, was really interesting was your 2021 winners that you've picked out uh, at the beginning of the year. And um, I like to point out that Kohl's is on the list and Manus, who is a favorite shopper of Kohl's, probably couldn't agree with you more. I love Kohl's. I mean, and I, I say this, it's, it's interesting because I think sometimes you have brands on there that are places where you love them, at least in part because you're a, you're a shopper. And so for me, you know, that great example is like Target and Costco and just brands that I love to buy things from, uh, you know, obviously every, you know, it, Everyone has their own pick. I think what's been amazing about Kohl's is, I think, two things. One, having their level of strength within a department store sector that's getting so hard hit is, is already a huge asset. And clearly, they benefit from outdoor settings. Clearly, they benefit from the kind of the size of their stores, et cetera. But what we really loved about what they were doing was that instead of just saying, okay, we're strong in a sector where our competitors are getting hit hard, let's just stay the course. It seemed like they ratcheted it up what they are going to try and accomplish. And so this partnership with Sephora, in my mind, is, is utter genius. And it speaks to how do we attract maybe slightly more upmarket audience, bring new people into our stores? How do we grab elements of what a department store at its best is, which is kind of these sections of other brands and allowing these other brands to be a draw in and of themselves. And I think that you're seeing a brand that's strong with a kind of value orientation that most other department stores don't have, plus this aggressive side of willingness and willingness to take chances like the Sephora concept. And that gives us just a tremendous amount of excitement in what they're capable of doing in this year. One of the th theories we've had all along, uh, particularly Joe, who's not on the call with us today, is you just mentioned it, the outdoor setting being more desirable currently in the COVID situation than an enclosed shopping mall. Is that something you've seen in the data or is it still too early to really know if that's a, a lasting and, and noticeable trend? So it's, this is such an interesting question because it's, it's definitely in the data that right now it's definitely better to be outdoors than indoors. And we see that not just in the department store sector, but even malls versus outlet centers. Um, but I do think that there is a major caveat that this pandemic, if you were creating a situation in a lab that would be bad for indoor malls, it would look very similar to what we're going through right now. Like this is the ultimate you know, challenge for that space. So do I believe that indoor malls are going to face a long-term disadvantage? Absolutely not. I think that they're going to be incredibly strong. I think the fact that uh, brands like Nace, if we think department stores again, that a lot of these chains are starting to right size, I think that's going to be really, really good. I think there's really powerful opportunities for brands that have been outdoor oriented to then test out what an indoor format could mean for them. I think you're going to see a lot more direct to consumer brands and product oriented companies expanding their offline presence, uh, a lot of newer types of formats that we haven't necessarily seen in malls and in large scale come into malls. So do I, I think, yes, in the current environment, it's really challenging to be a mall. Yes. The department store concept in the mall 
feels a little bit dated and certainly needs an upgrade. But malls, in terms of a longer term perspective, uh, we have very little doubt that they're going to have a very strong year so long as COVID lifts. Before we get to Martha's next question, I'll give you a plug for, for what I've seen uh, on your system. You know, I, I hadn't used it uh, prior to us starting to talk about this podcast. And, and I went on the site and incredibly valuable from, from my perspective, easy to use. And, you know, what it allowed me to do very quickly was look at two malls in Southern California very quickly. One was the Del Amo Fashion Center in Torrance, California, and the other in we the Westfield Culver City, you know, that allowed me to see how each one was doing with their foot traffic over time. And, and I would think that from a risk management point of view for, for CMBS investors, for underwriters, uh, for anybody playing in the derivative space in CMBX, this is just a, a great leading indicator for sidestepping landmines. First of all, thank you. I mean, we put a big focus on kind of accessibility and I, it was something we'll certainly discuss and why that is such a big piece of the puzzle within the data landscape. But, but yeah, I think there, if you have a stake in offline retail, it, you really need to know what's happening. And I would say it's very, very difficult to claim you know what's happening unless you have a resource that allows you to look at the entire retail landscape, and more importantly, with an apples to apples comparison. So every data source, every process of trying to understand visitors has a flaw in it or has a limitation. But if you have one that has a limitation and it's only looking at assets that either you own or you deal with, then how are you supposed to understand things within context? So I think that contextual understanding is so critical. And so, you know, even take a center that's been hit hard by COVID. Are they being hit hard because of the region they operate in? Are they being hit hard because there's a fundamental flaw that they're facing? How are they doing pre and post? How are they doing compared to their competitors? How are they doing compared to similar centers in other states and regions? This can provide so many deeper layers of understanding that allow you to go from, I have a sense of something to I have a really deep understanding of what's happening. Now, the commercial real estate market is not exactly cutting edge historically, right? You always think of the old school broker with, you know, the worn out souls and issues going from building to building and property to property. And if you ever talk about somebody who's been in it for 30 years, you mentioned a street corner and they know what building is on each street corner. You say they've been in it so long. Was there a lot of resistance to your software coming in or were people thinking, God, this is a game changer? I, I saw there, there's two pieces to this puzzle. The first is no there was not a lot of resistance. We, we were incredibly surprised as, a, you know, startup people, you know, coming from the tech world, our expectation was, you know, again, we didn't really understand this, the world of CRE. So our expectation was retailers, they're so advanced, that's going to be the first level of adoption. Instead, it was the opposite. It was commercial real estate who got it right away. And they were the ones who really adopted it quickly. They were the ones who really partnered with us closely to help us build out the platform faster and more effectively. I think that there is a, and, and maybe rooted in something true, but at least as long as I've been in the space, I find it that the commercial real estate sector as a whole is incredibly receptive to the fact that they haven't been fast enough to adopt new technologies and therefore incredibly eager to make sure they stay ahead of the curve now. But even more so, I think for, for we, we often see kind of data and the hunch, you know, that educated guess, that gut feeling as being contradictory. Whereas we don't see that as a contradiction. We see it as two sources of knowledge, right? Talk to someone who's been in the industry for four years. They have information and knowledge and insights that we could never do with a data platform. However, you take that same person and you ask him to try and explain what he or she is seeing when they go to a property of the rest of their team to help explain that thesis, that gut feeling. It's really, really difficult. You allow them to use our data. All of a sudden, you can apply that expertise at scale to any location anywhere in the US, and you can put numbers behind the ideas. So to realize that, oh, the thing that was triggering this, this instinct for me was actually a demographic mix that I wouldn't expect normally in a location like this, and that's what got me excited. Or it was the fact that certain types of retailers go really well together, but I could never put a number on that before. And so it's not just the ability to, yes, people have expertise and they can get those hunches and those hunches might very often be correct, 
but the, we're giving you the ability to explain, to sell, to, to, to show those ideas in an objective database fashion that is going to get more buy-in from, from partners. Imagine if you're, you know, releasing, you know, a broker trying to bring in the retailer, this is going to help you make that sale and make that pitch so much stronger. One of your recent pieces talked about the subsector in retail, which was fitness. And I was surprised to see that Planet Fitness actually is doing relatively well in this category. So give me some idea of what's happening in this category. So I think there's a few things happening. One, they, they got hammered, right? And it's to no fault of their own. I think COVID is a unique um, effect that can hurt businesses, even if they're doing everything right. Um, and, you know, again, not wanting to have a lot of people in an enclosed space, needing to shut down for long periods of time, that's going to be a difficulty. But when you look at a brand like Planet Fitness, while competitors with similar levels of reach were down 60, 70% year over year at, towards the end of that year, they were down just 30%. That's really impressive. And even more, the visitors that were coming back, they were coming back for a really similar type of visit, similar duration, similar distance traveled. And that tells us that people really love the experience. And then you add two more factors that get you really excited about it. One, they've lost the visitor who went to the gym after work. So if I'm working from home, right, and I, my gym was, you know, a two minute, well, you know, a two minute drive from my office, and I would go on the way back, I've lost that visitor in the short term, but that visitor will likely come back. And then even more than that, their value orientation aligns them perfectly for as we start getting back out again, and we don't want to just be in our homes and our Peloton is great, but it's not enough. The idea that it's a value-oriented gym, so I don't have to pay as much in a period of economic uncertainty, because we need to remember that even when COVID ends, the economic consequences will last far longer. So if I can be a more value-oriented solution to help you get back out there, to help you focus on that health and wellness that we've all realized is so critical, I'm going to be really well-positioned, and I don't think anybody is better positioned than Planet Fitness at the moment. It's interesting. As I'm hearing this, I'm wondering if there's a personal version of this product where you have family members calling up and saying, you know, when should I go to Disney World? When will the lines be short? When will be, there'll be the most social distancing going on? Or is there a part of the country where occupancy of the hotel is under 25% and I can uh, make sure to have a floor by myself? Do you have uh, friends and neighbors coming to you saying, uh, Ethan, give me the breakdown. Where should I be going uh, for the safe vacation with my kids? So, so not, I mean, not really, not yet, but um, I mean, I would say that, you know, <laughs> what we're here for about Disney is that it's a great time to go if you want it to be quiet. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, that's more from the hearsay of, of friends and colleagues than anything else. I, I think what's, what's changing, what's really significant in terms of making it a, a, a big change right now is the idea that in the past, you were able to build yourself on certain assumptions. And now many of those assumptions have just been completely undermined. So there is no assumption. You, you, you need the data to tell you the very basics. But what's amazing is once you accept that it's in this crazy situation, the assumptions are no longer true, you start to challenge whether the assumptions were always true in all other cases in the past. And that's where I think more levels get unlocked to allow professionals to see what if I question the way things were happening even a year ago, pre-pandemic? What if I question, you know, whether certain uh, tenants sit well together? And all of a sudden, you can get to different types of solutions. And you know, I'll get, you know, go on this tangent all the way. You know, we were talking about malls before. What if I look at a mall and say it doesn't need to have the normal retail mix? What if it doesn't need a department store? Instead, it can have a co-working space. And if it has a co-working space, can it have a Staples in it? Yeah, it's actually be a great audience to have nearby. What if I put a school in there? All of a sudden the staples works, the co-working space works. What if I put a grocery store in that mall space? And it allows you to start challenging norms that we used in the past because they were safe, because it was a more down the middle approach and allows you to take chances backed by data so that you can be creative, you can be innovative and aggressive, but you can do so while mitigating risk as well. So looking at foot traffic is just one data point, and as Manus mentioned, it can be a leading indicator of performance. But in looking at some of the winner's picks historically, you had uh, one on there Tuesday morning who actually uh, filed for bankruptcy 
uh, not too long ago and uh, was a firm that was struggling because of net cash flow problems. Give me an idea how you reconcile foot traffic data with overall performance data. So you use a little bit of common sense and then, and then we don't, like if that makes sense. So we, we are a location data company. And so we look at the world, especially in our efforts, we look at the world through a location data perspective. Now, obviously we apply common sense and sometimes we'll work with other data providers to see if we can give a wider picture. But Tuesday morning was a really interesting one. You know, we always, whenever we pick a list, we always have, you know, we started in our 2020 list, we picked Target. You know, a lot of people were like, oh, you know, what brave people to pick, you know, the greatest retailer in the country as one of their winners, you know, oh, good for you. But we also picked Bed Bath & Beyond. And Bed Bath & Beyond at the time was getting hit really hard, especially in the media. And what we said for Bed Bath & Beyond is, you know, let's ignore, there's certain challenges we don't have insights into. But we do have insight into uh, how their management team operates, what they've done in the past, and would that model apply well to Bed Bath & Beyond? And we said we think it will. We think it could actually work brilliantly. And in that, we were able to uncover, I think, value in Bed Bath & Beyond earlier than many others. And I'd say the same thing applies to Tuesday morning. So we did this when they were in the midst of going through bankruptcy. And then now recently they announced that they, you know, they're out of bankruptcy, but we looked at the sector. They're in the home goods space that is absolutely crushing and they're highly value oriented. So, you know, again, off price retail doing much better than regular retail, a brand like home goods doing even better than brands like Bed Bath & Beyond or Floor & Decor. This, this orientation towards, I'm going to help you save money at a time when you really want the products I'm offering is a really good mix. So if there's a brand, even with all of the craziness around them, that's well set up and well situated to outperform in the coming year, we think it's a brand like Tuesday morning. Does it mean they'll do so? Absolutely not. Does it mean with the right types of decisions and some good management, the, the stars are aligned for them to have a comeback? Absolutely, yes. So do you find customers for your business now coming in from the equity space, private equity, stock investors, stock researchers, that type of thing? It would seem that for guys going long or short particular retailers, this, this data would be really, really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we don't, we don't pretend to, a lot of these guys are, are especially when you think about the investment community, you know, you have that quantitative side that essentially give them the data. They are very, very good at kind of creating their own models. And for them, it's hands off, but those fundamental researchers, absolutely. The ability to really dive in, you know, I'll give you an example that I love, you know, CVS, CVS in 2019 announced that they were going to be expanding health hubs to, I believe it was 1,500 locations. We were able to look at the pilot health hubs that were in Texas at those three locations, understand how they performed, understand how they performed compared to how they were performing beforehand and how they were performing to the regional and state level CVS averages. And what we saw, and we put out a blog about it when we saw it, was this is a really exciting idea because it brings in visits at off-peak hours to a CVS. And what do we know about CVS? That there are, it has huge peak in the morning, huge peak in the evening, people on before or after work or school. And then also that, I don't know if you, I've ever walked into a CVS without buying 16 more things than I intended to get. So, you know, I wish you luck if you go in to buy shampoo or deodorant, not to end up with 75 other items. Right. And so I think for CVS, it was brilliant because you can have appointment, you can have scheduled visits in the middle of the day on off-peak hours, and you're likely going to not just add that new revenue stream, add it not at the expense of the parking lot or the people who are coming in, but then actually add more revenue from the normal purchases within the store. And that's the type of analysis you can do where looking at the chain, looking at the individual locations and doing those in, in kind of combination provides these this more robust view on a single brand. So I mentioned before I was trying your, your product uh, on the front end side. Tell us a little bit about how people consume this industrial strength. How often do they get the data updated and you know how it comes to them and, and how they would get their arms around something, like you said, to use it internally from a, a data science point of view? Sure. So we have the, the most basic thing we have is we have a section in our website called the square where we put up free data for anyone to use any time of day and it's updated regularly. And, you know, we have some sections that are less so, but, you know, it's updated ongoing. Then we have a free version of our tool, which is kind of like the appetizer or the amuse-bouche for like the premium product. And again, you <laughs> nice kind of French up there, that. Manis. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, uh, that's just me being a big Top Chef fan. <laughs> nice. I don't think but, Manus can pronounce that. You know, this is our second podcast in a row where Top Chef came in. Oh, so we I'll talked do. about it last week and we talked about it this week. So whenever you need a Top Chef reference, call me. Yeah. And so, so again, that, that more basic version, but then our platform, the whole, the, the amazing element of being a SaaS company. And so software as a service, a data platform you can come into whenever you want is we can add things all the time. So on an almost monthly basis, there is a new feature, a new tool within the platform that takes this core data set and finds a new way to apply it. And that's kind of our vision of the world of just constantly adding new features and, and new elements. So everything from visit trends to true trade areas, to cross shopping patterns, to you know going from the specific locations to chains and much more. And then the last bit is, you know we have customers who use it as a straight data feed. So they wanted to bring it in within their own models and, and, and uh, systems. And so we can do that as well. But, you know, I am obviously a huge fan of the dashboard. I think it makes it uh, very easy to use. And so I think the, one of the challenges with data companies, I think all too often it's data for data scientists. And I am not a data scientist. <laughs> so I need something that's a little bit more accessible and a little bit easier to use. And that's what this platform does. We don't have a customer who finds it too complicated to use. Uh, we certainly partner with all of them to make sure they learn how, but I think that's the other great thing about the free tools. You see that all of a sudden this complex data source can be really simple to use. And that's when we take a lot of pride in. You're in California, Ethan? So the company is headquartered in California uh, and we have R&D and product sitting in Tel Aviv. And so we're like a nice global business. <laughs> we get to work all around the clock. Nice. So tell us, we spent most of the time talking about retail. Give us uh, an idea of what you're seeing and some of the other property types, what you offer and you know what the business model looks like there for, for users. So I think right now we are very retail focused. Um, there's a lot of good value in office. One of the, you know, a tool that we're launching soon is our migration analysis tool to look how people are moving between cities. I think it's something that, you know, you think about New York, you know, in the Upper East Side's, of the people who were there in January, only 60% were there in October. So that's a really important tool in terms of understanding these migration patterns, both from the real sale perspective and from the office perspective. We're not heavily oriented towards, towards residential. A big part of that is we don't focus on specific locations and the residential side from a privacy perspective. Um, and you know, so we, we do, I think our main core right now is, is retail and all the things that have to kind of center around retail, though, and I think office, the use case is very clear and really exciting. Well, once you start seeing data of office presence and foot traffic, I'm pretty sure there'll be a lot of interest around that. I mean, so we did, we actually, you know, we were working with Bloomberg. They, they wanted to, they gave us a list of, I think it was four dozen major office buildings in New York City. And they wanted to know how things were recovering. And when we looked at it, we saw that they weren't. They were down 70 something to 80 something percent almost on a per building basis. And then when you looked at it in aggregate, what you were finding was less people were coming much, much less. But even more than that, it was because they, they were only coming from a very close distance. So if you lived near your office, you'd pop into the office every now and again. But if you were commuting from Connecticut or from you know, up, you know, New Rochelle, you weren't coming to the office anymore. And I think that is that was a really important indication for us of some of the things that were happening. But even, you know, think of the move of office to the suburbs. You know, it's a topic we talk about a lot because we think it's really game changing. But brands like Industrious who bring co-working into malls, you know, something we'd expect brands like WeWork and the like to do in the near future, understanding where you want to be, what the value it is that you actually bring to these retail locations and to these suburban environments can go a long way in helping you maximize that effort. So we saw a, a huge wave of COVID. We saw kind of a tapering off over the summer. People got kind of optimistic that we were getting towards the end, obviously October, November, December, January, a whole nother wave. People have been talking about the dark winter and, and things like that. Is there something in the data that we could give to our audience that provides them a green shoot, something which you've seen, which says, it's not as bad out there as you might think, right? There's a pocket of, of the world that is starting to show life. You know, of course, we know that Grocery Anchored has been good all along, Target, Home Depot, uh, that type of uh, entity. 
is there something you can hang your hat on and say, you know, before you start stockpiling beef jerky and firearms, here's something we could point to, which says, you know, better days are coming along. Well, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot. I think the biggest piece is what do you learn from the sectors that are succeeding? So, you know, I give a big hats off to a lot of uh, restaurant chains that were focused on dine-in visitors who quickly launched takeaway and drive and, and, and delivery. And that's really smart. I, I kind of, you know, slap on the wrist for brands who, as this home goods, home improvement surge was happening, and they had large home goods, home improvement stock, weren't leading with it. If you went to the website of a lot of brands that had a big element of their, of what they sell is in this booming segment, it was nowhere to be found on the homepage. It was nowhere to be found in their store windows. And, and that's just a missed opportunity. Uh, you know, even if I know that grocery is doing exceptionally well and that visit duration is growing, if I'm a CPG brand that sells snack food and I was really reliant on convenience stores in the past, guess what? I'm shifting my focus more to grocery. Or if I'm a local restaurant, I'm going to my local grocery and saying, hey, can I provide you with meal kits? How do I leverage the strength that's happening to get creative? You know, even uh, we were speaking with a, a South Florida uh, a leader in the commercial real estate sector on one of our webinars. And we were talking about how, you know, the Miami Heat or in the NBA finals, how many shopping centers set up a big screen next to their restaurant and said, hey, guys, we're going to eat on picnic benches. We're going to clear out the parking lot. And we're going to have a meal and we're going to try and we're going to socially distance, watch this game together. And there are ways to get creative. How many fitness brands have we heard of using parking lots to do fitness classes or figuring out ways to do some of it digitally and, you know, in, in video or, you know, Zoom workouts. I think that um, it's really important to remember that even in these really dark periods, especially on the business side, there's always opportunity and there's always a chance to, at the very worst, deepen your relationship with your customer and mitigate loss. But in some cases to, you know, flip the whole game on its head. And the more brands that get creative, the more business sectors that get creative and realize that this is as much as a, of an opportunity as it is a challenge, the more exciting things we're going to see in the near future. That is probably the Best send-off I've ever heard, Ethan. I think uh, a lot of positive stuff in there to chew on no matter where you are. So with that, we'll close this special podcast. Thank you to Ethan from Placer AI and thanks to our producer, Haley Keene. Join us later this week as we look at what's happened during the week and how it may be impacting you. If you have a question, send us an email at podcast at trep.com or visit trep.com for more info and subscribe to the podcast with your favorite provider. Thank you for listening and stay well. All right.